this is where you can get the advantage over other students. I, I suspect most students will have got that kind of answer there, but very few students will be going confidently into it thinking I can definitely get the three. Today we're joined by none other than Lewis from Physics Online. Hello, um, thanks for having me here. I thought we we're going to have a look at probably what is rumoured to be the hardest A-level physics paper out there. Have you heard the paper three is potentially the hardest one? I think it's hard because it's more difficult to prepare for, as in it's you don't know what can come up. And I suppose anything could come up, couldn't it? So that's why I think it's difficult. So, shall we have a look? Would you like to do the honours? Yeah, so um, this is an OCR paper. This one is Unified Physics. It's a 2022 paper. And this question is about uh, essentially astrophysics, and everyone loves a bit of astrophysics. Do you want to yeah. have a go at the first one? Okay, yeah. So the first one actually isn't isn't too bad, it's, I guess, about gravitational fields. There's lots of data, though, that's always difficult. Um, and also, it's Venus, because sometimes I think it's going to be Earth or the Moon, mm -hmm. and it's just definitely worth checking which planet they're talking about. If you find yourself writing 9.81, just make sure that you're on planet Earth. The first one uh, is we need to calculate the gravitational field strength at the surface. We've got the data book there. Um, from memory, I can remember that G is equal to GM divided by R squared. and then it's just a case of identifying the mass of the planet, mm -hmm. the radius, which is in kilometres. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add three more zeros to make that into metres because if I don't do it now, I'm going to forget later on. It's mm -hmm. um, a really, really good tip. Yeah, and again, obviously, you know, nobody cares what I'm doing to this table because it's like, you know, the, whoever's marking this just wants to see the right answer and some appropriate working out. So then we can just put the numbers in. Uh, so G is from memory 6.67 .6 times 10 to the minus 11 times 4.87 times... It's probably one of my favourite constants, actually. What do you reckon? Do you have, do you have a favourite constant? I quite like the elementary charge. Oh, that's a good one. 1.66, that's quite nice. But then, I don't know if it's my favourite, just because I've used it so many times. Mm. It's like, it's just ingrained itself for me. The, the, you know, thinking about it, there would be... <laughs> if I thought about it properly, there would be my favourite yeah. constants. Mm. But yeah, I, I like that Another one. video coming up. Okay, yeah. Um, so we've got the mass there. Uh, the radius, um, I'm going to put 6.05 times 10 to the 6, uh, just to kind of save me mm -hmm. writing too many zeros, and that's squared. And then all I need to do is just uh, put the numbers into my calculator. So I'm going to write this as 8.87450. Oh, so it's kind of like the number, the full number. And then I guess, I, 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 mean, I would be giving it to three significant figures anyway, like my raw data. Um, so that's just going to be equal to 8.87. Nicely spotted. Not everyone would have uh, spotted the three significant figures. Just have a good scan for the question to see exactly what you're being asked to do. Yeah, and to be honest, if I was doing this in an exam, I would know that's definitely correct, but I think it probably would be. If it was 10 times bigger, that'd be like 88, which would be massive, yeah. a lot more than Earth, and Venus is going to be similar to the size of Earth, uh, and it's not 0 0.8, so really, really small. So I think that's a, a, an approximate, it's, it's within the order of magnitude of the right size. So yeah, um, that's all good then. So yeah, uh, there we go. Yeah. Easy marks. Right, let's have a look at the next one. We've got two identical space probes, A and B, land on a flat surface of Venus. Um, I think that's actually wrong because I can see the space probes uh, over there, actually. Uh, they're not well, on Venus currently. Yeah, uh, so they're, they're currently uh, over here. Obviously, we need a bit of Lego. <laughs> uh, these are actually uh, kind of moon landers, but, you know, they look like <laughs> kind of probes that would land on another planet, which, which I suppose they are. But we've got two of them. Uh, we've got A and B. Um, so let's see what happens. Probe A lands on the North Pole, Pro probe B lands on the equator. Just as I'm reading this, this will probably be connected to the centripetal force and the centripetal acceleration that's acting on it. Okay, each probe has a certain mass and a volume yeah. of 1.7. Calculate the centripetal acceleration at the equator due to the rotation of Venus about its axis. How would you approach that? We've got two probes, but to be honest, this one is really about probe B. So to, for, for this question, that bit, I'm just going to ignore that. There's a couple of equations you could use, but I'm going to say that A is equal to V squared over R. To work out the, the speed uh, around the equator, uh, I can say that V is equal to 2 pi R over T. So we can do all pi over. And then I'm going to replace this V squared here with what we have over here. So we can also then say that A is equal to 4 pi squared we then have r squared over r, so that's just r divided by t squared. Um, and then we can just put the numbers in like this. 
as 5.42 times 10 to the minus 7 meters per second squared. Cool. It also, it is a value that we would normally expect because you don't feel, if you were to travel to the equator, enjoy the sunshine over there, you probably wouldn't feel the difference in, in rotational speed. So you're probably expecting like a really, really tiny number. Yeah, uh, because although it's big, it's moving relatively, and actually it's got, the period of rotation is 5,830 hours. That's a long time. That's it's not like time, it's spinning it? around really quickly. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hardly moving at all if we think about it, mm -hmm. especially compared to the Earth, which rotates every 24 hours so this is hardly moving at all so the yeah i'd have thought that the centripetal acceleration at that point is going to be fairly minimal cool so right. so far i thought those questions were okay i think they're fair questions and i think you know like the first one especially working out the strength of the gravitational field that's very similar to so many other kind of past exam paper questions. There is a question that came up from a subscriber, actually. In this case, we're, act we're looking for the magnitude of the gravitational field. Yeah. One subscriber uh, asked me in the poll, which, uh, which I did before the video, when do we put a minus sign, when do we don't put a minus sign? Now, this really depends on your exam board. Both are absolutely equally correct. Um, it's just which direction you take to be positive and which negative. Traditionally, the attractive potential is given a negative sign. However, in this case, we're just looking for the magnitude of the field. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the word magnitude is important. It's just the size of it. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think it should have a negative sign. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're looking at Newton's law of gravitation, uh, F equals minus GMM over R squared would be my preferred way because that mm -hmm. minus is important because it shows it's attractive. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to then things like if you're looking at maybe... Um, you know, like the, the force inside, mm -hmm. um, like subatomic particles, you know, when you've got that strong force, when it's negative, it's attractive, mm -hmm. when it's positive, it's repulsive. And I think that's important. So I think you should give a negative symbol, but ultimately, I don't think it matters. And I think the questions are phrased, so it doesn't really matter either. Now, the next question is about upthrust. Let's have a look. The atmosphere exerts the same upthrust on each probe. Use your answer to A to calculate the upthrust which acts on it. Hmm, I'm going to take this one because I really like the upthrust question. Go for it, yeah, yeah. And, so, <laughs> and here's part A as well, so I think oh, that might brilliant. be needed. Right. So, okay, the way we calculate upthrust is using Archimedes' principle. So we know that the upthrust will be equal to the weight of the fluid that's actually displaced. The way I remember is just by writing U is equal to the mass, that's the mass of the fluid, multiplied by G. Now, Mass is just density times volume, so this will just be equal to rho, the density, multiplied by V, multiplied by the gravitational uh, acceleration G. Now, I'm hoping that all of these are actually given. Uh, let's have a look. If they are, this is going to be a fairly straightforward three mark question. So, are we? do we have the density? We do up here in the table. Okay, perfect. So this here is equal to 65. Uh, multiplying by the volume, which seems to be given to be 1.7. And then I'm so tempted to write 9.81. If you find yourself writing 9.81, just make sure that you're on planet Earth. But it's not 9.81, it's uh, 8.87. So far, this seems pretty straightforward with three marks. Almost making me suspicious, actually. No, but I know what you mean, yeah. but I think... I suppose the skill comes from trying to identify where the numbers are across the whole question. Mm -hmm. And also, I suppose, not be distracted by the mass of the actual uh, lander itself. Because mm -hmm. it's it's the volume of fluid displaced, not due to the mass of this. So I think mm -hmm. that mass there at the moment isn't really helping us. So, yeah, I think it's all, all looking good so far. Cool. So, shall we see whether we get a nice little answer? So, oops, I'm going to do 65 multiplied by <clears throat> 1.7 multiplied by 8.87. So it's going to give me an upthrust of around 980 newtons. Okay, so far so good. Yeah, that seemed absolutely deceptively easy for three marks, but you've had to identify about upthrust, upthrust being equal to the weight of fluid displaced. You've done the calculation, and I guess you've got your answer. So three marks, you know, given like that, I think it's absolutely fine. But now we've got an explain question for three marks, and these can be kind of tricky to get our head around with, but luckily we've got Lewis here to help us. Yeah, so again, I think the questions like this, the explain ones are where if you're working hard and you've been studying well, this is where you can get the advantage over other students. I, I suspect most students will have got that kind of answer there, but very few students will be going confidently into it thinking I can definitely get the three. 
So explain which probe. So you've got A, which is on the, the North Pole, and you've got B on the equator. Which will experience the greater normal contact force from the surface of Venus? Okay, so anything to do with forces, I tend to draw a diagram. I do the same. And, and this helps me, you know, just try and formulate things. So if I just think of this is A, okay, so that's my, my picture of the lander mm -hmm. A, um, there's going to be a downwards force due to its weight, like this, so that's its weight. I, I suppose if I was explaining this normally, I tend to use different colors in the video, but I'm just gonna go for blue like it was an exam, like just one color. So, sure. okay, well let's, let's go for some more colors. So yeah. we've got the weight acting down, uh, which is due to its mass times the gravitational field strength. We don't have to calculate it. There's going to, but so I suppose that would be 760 times 800. And, so it's basically about um, 7,000. So it's like 7,000 down, but it's 980 up. So really the up thrust is provided by the atmosphere. So I'm just going to label that U. And so U is a lot smaller than the weight. And then I'm just going to get another pen. Okay, so I've got a blue pen here. Um, we know that on the North Pole, it's not moving up or down, and it's just kind of it's just kind of rotating on the spot. So there's going to be no resultant force on it. And that means the normal contact force upwards. So I call it N to be the normal contact force. Yeah, basically, um, we can say that on, at the North Pole, the normal contact force plus the up thrust, and that force is going up, is equal to the weight of the object down. And effectively, we can say that the sum of all forces is zero. Okay, so yeah, I, think, I think it's a clear way of doing it without too many words at the moment. So that's A. I think this is really, really important because we can really... Uh, once we understand the the actual mathematics of how to solve the question, the actual mechanics of how to solve the question, putting it into words afterwards is not so bad. Yeah, and maybe I should have maybe done it underneath so you could like kind of write some proper sentences here. But I, you know, up there is fine. And I think the people marking this, they, they tend to be people like us who just like nerdy math people, uh, which is in, in a good way. You know, it's in like the people marking this, they understand the notation, they understand what this is representing. Okay, so B. Now, so probe B is going to be on the equator, and that means it's going to be orbiting like this. But some forces are the same, so it's going to have exactly the same weight force down. There's going to be an up thrust upwards, and the up thrust is going to be the same size because we've got, again, the same volume of fluid displaced, so the up thrust is going to be the same. But the difference here is that there must be a resultant force acting on this. The centripetal force is due to the resultant force on this. Okay, so the the sum of the forces, I'm gonna say is Fc to be centripetal. And if it's going around like this, then that force must be inwards. So if I just put a thing to the side, effectively the resultant force on B is going to be down like that. That means that although there's going to be a normal contact force, the normal contact force here on B is going to be smaller than the normal contact force on A because effectively down here we could say that, um, getting too many colours, we could say that the normal contact force B plus the up thrust minus the weight is equal to this, so I don't use the wrong colour for weight there is equal to the centripetal force. Okay, does that, does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, I think one of the tricky parts here is the rule which I always use is that the centripetal force is essentially your net resultant force. Sometimes I almost dislike that it has a separate name, but mm. any time we're moving in a circle, basically the sum of all forces is directed towards uh, the center of rotation. Yeah, so if that force is zero, and the sum of those forces is greater than, is equal to the centripetal force, and we basically we can say that Na is going to be bigger than Nb. So basically what I've said is that the normal contact force at A is bigger than the normal contact force at B. Um, and although obviously I haven't written it in any words, I would actually write it and explain it clearly so that anybody reading this would understand what I was actually, I suppose, getting to. So I could say that because the probe at B has a centripetal force which is acting inwards and they both have the same weight and the same up thrust acting on them, 
then uh, the normal contact force at A must be bigger than the normal contact force at B. Uh, first time I calculated that, I actually, actually got the, one of these signs wrong, so that's uh, that's really, really interesting approach. Yeah, but I, I suppose actually I didn't do any calculations, did I? But I could have, we know the weight, because mm -hmm. it's the mass times the gravitational field strength, we know mm -hmm. the size of the upthrust. Um, actually, in part B, part I, we worked out the centripetal acceleration, and therefore we could actually count actually calculate the centripetal, the size of that centripetal mm -hmm. acceleration on that object. So we could actually work these out. And I suppose if you did that, you would then have, again, that that would help your explanation where you've calculated it and you've given this is the size of the force at mm -hmm. A and the force at B. So yeah, um, I think that at the end of the question, yeah. So that uh, was the first question. Um, yeah, what next? Good. What yeah. next? Let's have a look. So we shall we have a look at question number two. What have we got? We've got a student investigating the oscillations of a uniform rod. Okay, describe how to accurately determine the period of oscillations. You just take one reading and that's it, isn't it? Um, I would say this is like your standard issue question. It's about timing multiple things. I've seen this many times on other exams and things like that. So we've got the, the rod here and I think there is a practical you can do uh, looking at how this um, actually oscillates. Because it's not just a pendulum with a mass at the bottom, mm. it's, it's more of a distributed mass. But in order to work <laughs> out the, the time, um, I would say, that the things that I would say is that you've got to record the time for at least 10 oscillations. Uh, you might mention taking repeated readings and finding mm -hmm. a mean of those. And then you're going to divide by 10 to find the time period for one oscillation. So that's the first thing I would say. The second point I didn't actually get when I did this, when I did some, uh, when I worked through my answers, because I forgot to mention oh, how no. you actually time it. Even if it seems really, really obvious, I mean, what else could we measure time with? We, have, we still have to say that we have to measure it with a stop clock. It's like, it's so obvious that lots of students might have forgotten that. I, I did. Um, the point I did make, actually, when I, when I wrote my answer, was I said that you should record the time as the rod goes through the lowest point and not at the highest point. So you start and stop your recorder at the bottom, and the reason for that, it, it sounds a bit weird, but basically when it gets to the top, it's slowing down and then it stops and then it moves in the other direction. And it spends a fair amount of time at each end, whereas it only spends a very short amount of time in the middle, because that's when it's going with the, the highest uh, velocity. And so you're going to get a much better reading of knowing exactly when to start and stop the watch when it's moving quickest, as opposed to at the end. Um, so you might have some kind of marker uh, you might kind of mention that, and that's again going into the real kind of fine detail. Mm -hmm. But you know that's kind of good practice. That if you're looking at a pendulum or maybe a mass going up and down, you record it like the equilibrium position. In fact, if this was just, if we were to magically change this to three marks, this is probably the marking point that the examiners would be expecting. Yeah. So um, the first part was actually all right, wasn't it? Yeah. Let's um, have a look at the next one. Now. Oh, look at that. I like that. Um, okay, this, this doesn't even have the question on this page. So there's lots of information here. I see we have a nice straight line uh, with error bars, which kind of makes me think we're going to do something with uh, percentage uncertainty and worst acceptable lines of best fit or however we say it. It's, um, <laughs> line of worst fit sometimes. I'm guilty of just calling it the line of worst fit, but it really is the uh, the line of worst acceptable fit. Yeah, I think it's a bit <laughs> of a mouthful, isn't it? So yeah, yeah we'll see how that goes. Right, so um, loads of stuff there. And then we get into the actual Ooh. questions. So do you want to do the... I love a bit of Y equals MX plus C analysis. Cool. Uh, so we need to show that the gradient of the graph is given by this equation. Well, quite often actually, I've seen that a typical mistake might be to try and calculate the value from the gradient. Even if you don't know this equation, do not panic. So my equation is that F is a one over two pi square root of three G over two L. Now, the frequency is just one over the time period, and that's a way of linking this to whatever is on the y-axis. So I can just say that one over the time period is one over two pi root three g divided by two l. <laughs> I tend to write underneath y is equal to mx plus c just to show the examiner that I know what's happening. So I'm gonna say if t squared is on the y-axis, if L is on the x-axis, then my gradient should be 8 pi squared over 3g. Boom. 
I think that's really important actually just to sometimes write down y equals mx plus c and I think that's often why y equals mx plus c is so important because it's related to some kind of practical experiment where then the gradient might allow you to actually work out a physical constant. Exactly. So yeah so so this kind of experiment really it's it's not really looking at how two things are related it's like the whole reason that we do this experiment is we can use it to find a physical constant which in this case is g. So Look at this, they've even given us the gradient oh, of the next nice. part. We don't have to calculate it. Yeah, so we, we know the gradient is given to us, and we want to find the value of g. But we know the gradient, even if we couldn't do all of this, we know what the gradient means. Mm -hmm. So the gradient is 2.64, and that's equal to 8 pi squared over 3g. Okay, so that's gradient, and that's the value of it. And we just want to know what g is equal to. So then g is just equal to 8 pi squared divided by 3 times 2.64. Um, that's all it is, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Um, that seems, again, a relatively straightforward uh, two marks. There we go. Oh, that's good. Uh, this is equal to 9.969. So, 9.97. I'm going to use uh, three significant figures, like given to me over here. Um, yeah, so I think that's it really, and I think that's kind of what we're expecting. Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, if you've done this experiment in the lab, or if you try to measure G via any method in the lab that probably doesn't involve light gates, you will know that this is notoriously difficult to measure. Yeah, so if you're getting a value of 9.8, then you've probably got either very lucky or somebody's like messing up the results somehow and you're necessarily <laughs> cheating. So, yeah, okay, so that's good. Uh, now we're going to draw a line of worst fit. So they're calling it a line of worst fit mm -hmm. or worst acceptable line of best fit. There's no definite scientific terminology that is exact. But so You need yeah. to make sure that it goes right through those error bars. The term that I normally quite like using is bottom of bottom, top to top, but either one works really. How would you approach that? Yeah, so I'm going to use a clear 30 centimetre ruler. That is important um, because it means you can... I know I've printed this out bigger so for it's easier for us to write on, mm -hmm. but a long ruler is important, not like a 15 centimetre one. Um, and I've also made sure that when I do the line, it's going to go through all of the error bars, so it's not missing any of them out. And I reckon it's something a bit like this. Okay, so I'm just going to do it in pencil. I'd probably go over that in pen in the exam to make sure it's definitely clear, but... It just means that the first time, if I make any mistakes, I can always rub it out. So yeah, uh, that's it, one mark. Yeah, that looks good to me. I, I could have gone shallower. I suppose I could have gone like this, couldn't I? Because I could have gone through those error bars. That would have been absolutely fine as well. Yeah. And both of these are always accepted. So this looks really, really good. In fact, I'll even just award that mark already. Thank you very much. Uh, okay then. Um, so I suppose the reason that we've had to draw that is because we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. And it says here to use your line of worst fit to calculate the percentage uncertainty in G. This is my percentage uncertainty. That is not official terminology, but that allows me to understand. So percentage uncertainty. It's going to be equal to the best. So I'm going to put M best. Take away M worst. Divided by M best. I'm going to take the modulus of that, I'm going to times it by 100. And I think that's the, the simplest way I've done it. So This question is also not actually given in the exam. So especially before paper three, but throughout your papers, it's just really important to go over a few questions such as these. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've got plenty more practice in my uh, daily workout books. <laughs> yeah, <there's> loads <laughs> of questions. If this is the kind of thing you like, then you'll love this book. If you hate doing this, then you need this book because it'll make you do it. So um, it's basically, quite, you can't get away from it. They're, they're important things to do. Okay, so um, that means we need to calculate then the gradient of the line of worst fit. So it's like, I could just record it off the graph, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of, this is like my working out basically, and I'm gonna draw a massive triangle so would an examiner accept like a tiny little triangle such as this one? Uh, they shouldn't do, no. So basically you want to have the triangle being at least um, half the length of the line. But I would say go to the maximum points because if you go to the maximum, then you can't really you exactly make any mistakes. That's what I say in lessons as well. Is it? Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Oh, 
As he's calculating this, we're probably expecting a larger number because the line is steeper. So let's see what we get. Oh, 2.9. Yeah, so um, 2.91667, uh, basically. So yeah, um, mm -hmm. a little bit steeper than the 2.64. So that's a gradient of the line of worst fit. So if we kind of use this equation here, it's basically 2.64 take away 2.91667 divided by 2.64 times 100 and I do the modulus of that I guess so um, so this gives me an answer oh, it's, it's minus 10.47 but it's also going to be the positive value and I think 10.5 is fine but really I think that all of that's to two significant figures. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that to the two significant figures, that's equal to 10%. Uh, is that right? Let's hold for the mark scheme. <laughs> okay, so. Um... Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, expect answer 10. Fantastic. There we okay. go. Um, yeah, so, uh, but again, it's like a lot of these graph ones, there's a little bit of leeway. I would say, though, it seems really basic to like kind of have to put the triangle on, mm. but just draw it it's like you're gonna if you don't do that and you make a mistake you're gonna lose a mark so at the very least draw it off so far this question is quite good isn't it i like this one this yeah, is good yeah. with this That's question good. right okay next one use the true value of g 9.81 meters per second squared to evaluate the accuracy of the student's value of g from this experiment once again we need to include a calculation so this is one of those questions where we have to remember yet another formula and that is the formula for percentage difference so percentage difference how would you write that uh well that's easy that's i'm just going to put percentage d mm -hmm. um However, yeah, then it's like, there's not a, a simple way to do it. But this is basically the difference between your experimental value. I'm just going to put EXP for experimental and the true or the kind of accepted value. So the true value here is 9.81 and that's divided by the true value. Again, you take the modulus of that and then you'd multiply it by 100 to get it as a percentage. <laughs> They're basically within 1.6%, which is pretty close. It's really honest. good. If you, if you do an experiment and you get within 1% or 2% of the real answer, then you're doing something well, or you've just got very lucky. Um, but that doesn't answer the question. So we've done the calculation, <laughs> but the question says, uh, evaluate the accuracy. If your percentage difference is lower than your percentage uncertainty, then you can account for any errors in the reading, and therefore it's an accurate experiment. So here... 1.6% is the difference between the experimental value and the true value, and that's a lot smaller than the experimental errors and the percentage of uncertainty in those. So because it's smaller, that means it's an accurate experiment. Um, but actually, likewise, if you had a super million pound thing to measure G, and you had everything to like the millionth of a millimetre, there was like 0.01% error in any timing or anything like that, and you still got an answer that was 1.6% off the true value, then that wouldn't be an accurate experiment. And also, I suppose there's, there's, we could do a whole paper, we could spend hours. We did an absolutely amazing question on an actual tent. This question is actually one of the hardest from OCR. So go over to Lewis's channel, subscribe, check out his book right over there somewhere. Oh yeah, buy the book. But thank you so much for having me uh, here My in pleasure. the video. And it's been really fun actually doing some questions together. It's been, been awesome actually yeah, and sharing yeah. some ideas. So. Yeah, Amazing. I thought those questions were good, and uh, thank you so much. Thanks.